welcome to morning prayer here from the parish of St Peter, West Blatchington in the city of Brighton and Hove. My name is the Reverend Tim and you join me here this morning uh, from the rectory garden and uh, you might be hearing some different noises happening at some point. There's seagulls flying overhead, you hear the chirruping of sparrows and uh, if you hear any barking it's probably Maggie Dog who, uh, who's seen a few squirrels and she's quite excited about that. We've got some great readings from God's Word this morning and some great prayers to pray. So let me lead us now as we begin our time in morning prayer. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. When we cry out to the Lord in our trouble, he will deliver us from our distress. God will bring us out of darkness and out of the shadow of death. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. So let us give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and the wonders he does for his children. Let us offer him sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his acts with shouts of joy. Today's first reading comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 21, beginning at verse 8. The child Isaac grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she'd born to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son. For the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that the offspring shall be named after you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What an amazing story of how God is able to transform human misery into good news. We begin that passage in Genesis with the fallout of Abraham's two sons. Now God had promised Abraham and his wife Sarah a child through whom the promise to bless every nation was going to come about, but they'd got impatient waiting. So they came up with a plan that Abraham should take Sarah's uh, maidservant, Hagar, and that uh, he should have a child with her, which he does, and he's called Ishmael. But then the promise to Sarah comes true and God gives her a son and they call him Isaac. And now he's the favoured son, what do you do with Ishmael? He's not as necessary anymore. And this squabbling happens and 
uh, Sarah complains to her husband Abraham. Abraham says, well, just do whatever you, you think is right. And then they're instructed to send Hagar and Ishmael on their way out into the wilderness. Uh, it seems a bit like a death sentence. It seems a pretty uh, grim thing. They take some bread and a skin of water, but that's it. They go out into the wilderness defenceless and weak. But it's there that Hagar, in her distress, not even able to, to be near her child because she knows that he's going to die, it's there that she encounters God. And God says that well-repeated command we find in the Bible, do not be afraid, because he has heard the voice of the boy crying out. Not only has God heard, but God is going to do something about it. He promises to make a great nation from him, this boy who is near death's door. He shows her a well of water. Her thirst can be quenched. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And then we're, we're told that God was with him as he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. What a transformation God can bring to our lives. But so often that transformation happens only when we get out into those wilderness spaces, when life gets hard. Perhaps you're in a, a season like that at the moment. Perhaps you feel things are just rough, whether that's because of a diagnosis or going through medical treatment or depression or loneliness or just feeling a bit down. Well, God uses those times. If we cry out to him, God will come to us because he sees us, he hears us, and he will turn that misery off us into good news. Today's psalm is Psalm 86. The refrain is, you, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion, together. You, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion. Bow down your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and in misery. Keep watch over my life, for I am faithful. Save your servant who trusts in you. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for you are my God. I call upon you all the day long. You, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, and great is your love towards all who call upon you. You, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the time of my trouble I will call upon you, for you will answer me. Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord, nor anything like your works. You, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion. All nations you have made will come and worship you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you are great, you do wondrous things, and you alone are God. You, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion. Turn to me and have mercy upon me. Give your strength to your servant and save the child of your handmaid. Show me a sign of your favour so that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. You, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Our second reading comes from the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, he will be certain, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin, for whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. 
death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, our world is constantly trying to avoid death. It's probably the biggest taboo, certainly in our culture here in the UK. People don't like to talk about it. Even at funerals, we don't say that someone has died. We say they've passed away or they're now at rest. But actually, the Bible is very frank about death because it's a part of life. And people spend lots of money and time trying to avoid death, trying to put it off as long as possible. And that's a good thing. Death is a, is a horrible thing. But actually, we can't put off death ourselves. We need to look to the only person who has defeated death. And the Apostle Paul makes it clear that that is the Lord Jesus. He died and rose again. He will never die again. And he spoke there of the treasures of being united in Christ. Christians aren't just people who follow the teachings of Jesus, although that's part of it. We are people who by faith in Christ are in Christ and the Holy Spirit is in us. We are joined to him. So what has happened to him will happen to us. He died and rose again and through faith in him we know that our death actually leads to life. But eternal life doesn't just start after we die. Eternal life starts now and that means we need to be living out those principles of eternal life. As Paul says in that final verse, so you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So today we need to consider ourselves dead to sin. Sin is powerful, temptation is powerful, but we need to consider ourselves dead to those things. We're not that person anymore. The things that you struggle with are going to be different to the things that I struggle with, but all Christians struggle with sin. The point is that we struggle with it and that we don't give up and let sin do what it does in our life. We must consider ourselves dead to it. How can we do that? Well, only because we are alive in Christ Jesus. We are alive to God. Our Gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 24. Jesus summoned the twelve and sent them out with the following instructions. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground unperceived by your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You have more value than many sparrows. Everyone therefore who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And no one's foes will be members, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves sons or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, in true Jesus fashion, he says some things that sound very wonderful and comforting, alongside some things that sound very difficult and hard to digest. And there's a lot, and there's a lot in there, but some things are worth just pointing out. Firstly, he begins by teaching about how his disciples will be treated in a likewise way to the way that he's been treated. 
we shouldn't expect to face hardship, we shouldn't be surprised, sorry, to face hardship being a Christian. Remember that it was the religious leaders especially, and those in authority, who tried to get rid of Jesus. So don't be surprised if we get cancelled for being a follower of his as well. But he says, don't fear them, because God is in control, God is judge, and one day he will put all things right. So don't be fearful, but be courageous. Don't hide your faith away, but like he says, shout it from the rooftops. Fear of death, though, is a repeating theme in our readings. And Jesus recognises that would be true for his disciples and those hearing this. He says, don't fear those who can kill the body. Many of our brothers and sisters around the world, as they gather today, or in their homes, praying, need to hear that message because there are those who would seek to kill them just because they are Christians. But they are not to fear because the worst thing that those people can do to them is kill them. They cannot take away their eternal life. Jesus then comforts those thinking about this by getting them to think about birds. Now, if you listen, you can just about hear the sparrows. To me, that is the sound of a hot summer's day. It's not a hot summer's day today, but it might be when you're watching this. The next time you hear those sparrows, maybe walking past a hedgerow, and you hear those sparrows sort of cheeping away, I want you to remember this verse and how Jesus used those sparrows in the example to help us not to fear not to fear death. He says that even the sparrows are known by God, are loved by him, and you are much more precious than a sparrow. A sparrow doesn't spend its whole day on its nest worrying about what might happen. It gets on with what it needs to do, being a sparrow. It goes out, it gets the food, it gets its drink, it does whatever things sparrows do. And so God calls us to get on with the jobs of being Christians. Not to hide away, but like Jesus says, to claim it from the rooftop, to live it out. Now, where might you live that out? That might be in your workplace, might be at school, might be in your home, might be online, might be all sorts of different places that you can be a witness. You don't need to be afraid. Remember, God cares about the sparrows. He cares about you far more. But then Jesus finishes with some quite troubling words and those would have been far more troubling in his day because Jesus was speaking to a culture that highly valued family. Now we, we value family today but bringing shame to your family was the worst thing that you could have done in Jesus' day. But he says that his teaching will cause even families to be divided and it's one of the sad truths that I have witnessed in, in ministry over these years is where there has been that division, and often that has been connected to one or some of the people having faith and others just not being interested. Now most of the time, it, that doesn't happen. And there are many people who have unbelieving spouses or, or children or, or parents, and, uh, and they are happy to support them, even though they don't believe. But sometimes it does happen. Sometimes it does cause division. When people see who Jesus is but reject him, then that division can occur. But Jesus says, don't put your love of anyone, even those closest to you. I remember being in a church service and hearing someone talk about how they love Jesus more than their wife. I was a very new Christian at that point, and that completely blew me away. Totally shocked. You love Jesus more than you love your wife. I thought loving your wife is the most important thing, but no, it's not. Loving Jesus is more important. But here's the, here's the thing. If we love Jesus the most, then actually we will love our wives or husbands or children or parents better because we're not putting the pressure on them of treating them as if they're our God, our Saviour. Only Jesus can cope with that love. Our family and friends cannot. But as C.S. Lewis said, if we put the first things first, we get the second things thrown in. If we put love for Jesus first, then love for others will come naturally and it will be a lot freer. But the shape of following Jesus is cross-shaped. That's why the cross is such an important symbol for us as Christians. We must take up our cross and follow 
him. Taking up our cross isn't just facing inconveniences, it is facing the way of death. It's facing death of this world in order to receive eternal life. It is the way of the Master, it is the way of Jesus, the way of the cross. But we need the Holy Spirit and we need prayer to do that. So let me lead us now in some prayers. High and holy God, robed in majesty, Lord of heaven and earth, we pray that you will bring justice, faith, and salvation to all peoples. Especially we pray for those here in the parish of St. Peter's, but also amongst our city here in Brighton and Hyde, amongst our friends and families who we know and love, but do not yet know you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you chose us in Christ to be your people and to be the temple of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you will fill your church with vision and hope. Please be with us and unite us here at St. Peter's and across this deanery and across this diocese that we might consider your ways, take up our cross and follow you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your Spirit enables us to cry, Abba, Father. He affirms that we are fellow heirs with Christ and he pleads for us in our weakness. So we too pray for all who are in need or distress. We lift before you now those who we know who are suffering and those who care for them. And we pray for ourselves too in our own pain and suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the baptism and birth of Jesus, you have opened heaven to us and enabled us to share in your glory the joy of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit from before the world was made. So may your whole church come to a joyful resurrection in your city of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and have sent the Spirit of your Son into our hearts, whereby we call you Father. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that we and all creation may be brought to the glorious liberty of the children of God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray with confidence, as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for morning prayer. Do hope you have a, a wonderful and blessed day as we think about living a cross-shaped life, as we don't fear death, but as we trust God. And don't forget to listen out for those sparrows and let God remind you too. Let's close our time with a prayer of blessing. So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the love and comfort of Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.